Hello, everyone. Welcome to Unsafe Space. I'm your host, Carter Laren, and today we're going to talk about a topic that we've not covered at all, but has been in the news for, I guess, over a month now, which is the coronavirus. And specifically, not to try and get you know, gin up fears or anything like that, but to kind of give an overview of the status of it, but also how it might have some implications for what's happening in China and potentially in the U.S., on uh, unrelated to uh, health issues, kind of some secondary uh, results. And so today I have with me a guest who would like to remain anonymous specifically because she may be saying things that the Chinese government might not love, and so she'd like to remain anonymous. Uh, so we're going to call her Ying Lu. For those of you who have watched Yangshi Palace, you'll know why we're calling her Ying Lu. And she is a Chinese citizen, and she owns businesses in China. She owns multiple businesses in China and has offices here in Silicon Valley. She happened to be in Silicon Valley when the coronavirus outbreak occurred, and she's unable to return as a result. And But, but her family is still stuck in China and dealing with the coronavirus. So she's in a unique position because she's paying attention to Chinese media. She's got family there, and she also deals with cross-border business issues that she can talk about. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ying Luo. Hello, Ying Luo. Thanks for joining. Hi. I'm glad to be here. So maybe we should just start off giving people a background of the coronavirus. I think it's now called COVID-19. Its origin was in the Hubei province, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah, that's correct. In, all right, so that's the province, Hubei, and the city is Wuhan. And the first case was identified in early December, I think technically the 1st of December, and then seven more cases were discovered between the 8th and 18th. And these were linked to a seafood wholesale market in Wuhan. But things escalated very quickly. And by the 30th of December... There was a doctor, Dr. Li, who is an ophthalmologist at Wuhan Central Hospital. He went on to a service called WeChat. For those of you who don't know WeChat, is it's like a how how would you describe it, Yingle? It's like a Facebook Messenger type of thing. Yeah, it's like a WhatsApp uh, or like Signal, Telegram, those kind of messaging apps. Right. So he went he went on to WeChat and he posted in in a group for his uh, alumni of his medical school, so colleagues. He posted in a forum there saying that there was this cluster of seven patients. They were being treated. They were diagnosed with with SARS and being treated for symptoms of viral pneumonia, and the treatments were unsuccessful. So he was warning them, hey, there's some kind of unknown disease here. Be on the lookout for it. And that didn't go well. By the evening, the Chinese National Health Commission announced that eight doctors— in this WeChat forum, including Dr. Lee, were arrested by the Wuhan police and charged with illegal acts of fabricating, spreading rumors, and disrupting social disorder. Do I have that correct so far, or do you want to add anything? Yeah, so for arrested, uh, the government keep um, saying that it was not arresting. Uh, it was just like, kinda, uh, it's called like um, education, I guess, and they have to sign a paper that they acknowledge this is rumor and they will not do that again. <laughs> so it's uh, the communist version of arresting is you're forced to sign some paper and you can't leave until you do. That is correct, I guess. <laughs> okay. So so then things got worse, of course, because there was not this general awareness of what was going on. So it took until January 22nd of this year for the government to announce a quarantine. So they canceled flights and trains from Wuhan. They suspended public transportation in Wuhan. And But the issue is that it looks like about 100,000 people had already departed from the Wuhan train station before the deadline, kind of knowing that this was coming. And some Wuhan residents actually bypassed checkpoints by taking antipyretics which are drugs that can lower your temperature so it's harder to screen you know one of the things that they do 
when you go through an airport or some kind of border crossing, often they have thermal imaging so that they can see people who have elevated temperatures and potentially quarantine them. So people were taking antipyretics so they could get past those. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Ying Lu, but I think that's how I think that's how the coronavirus got to Europe. Is that right? Yeah, there were uh, some uh, idiotic uh, travelers. They actually brag about how they cheated the whole way and then get to Europe, um, and then they post everything on WeChat platform. And then I think after that, uh, it. Uh, I don't know. The police notice that and then like start kind of chasing after those people. Okay. Uh, that's just really irresponsible. But on the other hand, I also have seen people uh, sharing their stories because for Wuhan alone, there's only a few hospital, and then the medical resources really constrained. If you don't get out, and there will be a lot uh, less. Uh, opportunity for you to get actually treated. So you're saying it's kind of understandable that these people wanted to escape. Right. But some people like this uh, <laughs> brag about they got out and to travel and like eating uh, like fancy food in some uh, nice restaurant. Those people are not what I'm talking about. Those okay. So it's not stupid. like they, some people yep. escaped presumably to get treated. Some people escaped to, to party in Europe. Yeah. Okay. Well, so by the next day, uh, public transportation was suspended, including all bus, metro, and ferry lines in Wuhan, and outbound trains and flights were halted, and they announced the construction of a specialist emergency hospital starting on January 23rd. And actually, that hospital was completed and opened by February 3rd, which is pretty amazing. The next day, January 24th, Seven provinces and two autonomous regions and all four municipalities of Hubei and several other cities, including Beijing and Shanghai, declared a level one public health emergency. And another city was quarantined, which raised the total number of people in quarantine by the 24th of January to 35 million. And the entire Hubei province came under a city by city quarantine, except for two of the districts. All 70,000 Chinese cinemas across the country were closed until further notice. Uh, Tourist sites were closed, including the Forbidden City and Shanghai Disneyland and that kind of stuff. And the Beijing and Shanghai governments all urged residents to basically stay home to combat the spread of the disease. So one thing that's interesting, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, there's there's a difference sometimes between what governments do and what they say. We're trying to pay attention to more to what they do because what they do is indicative of maybe the seriousness of the problem more than whatever they're telling the public. So by the next day, by January 25th, the level one health emergency was declared in 10 provinces and three autonomous regions. So now it was in effect. So China has 31 provinces, basically, and 30 of them are now in level one health emergency by the 25th of January. So you can see this is escalating really quickly. And the only one that wasn't in a level one health emergency by the 25th of January was Tibet. And the Chinese National Health Commission is was at that point then sending, I think they sent 1,200 medical staff to Wuhan City. They also sent military people to Wuhan City. So by the 26th of January, the government had decided to close schools until further notice, which is a big deal in China, for those of you familiar with Chinese culture in any way. They also decided to extend the Spring Festival. Now, Yinglo, that's, is the Spring Festival is like the Chinese New Year thing, right? Yeah. And why did they extend the Spring Festival? Uh, because normally, uh, after the spring festival, all the migrant workers will go back to the big cities. So in order for people to not to be super contagious, cause the, no one, uh, knows how this going to be look like when people re- like, like kind of pack an airport or like, uh, railways stations, it will be much, much worse. So, so basically they're trying to prevent people from traveling traveling yeah. yep mm-hmm. okay so by so the next day there was another city uh shangyang i'm probably pronouncing that wrong in hobei they suspended ferry services which meant now the entire 
uh, province was under a city by city quarantine except for the forestry district. So now you've got basically everything in the province under quarantine. And they closed railway stations, airports, inner city buses across the province. Uh, Wuhan even suspended passport services for Chinese citizens. And the Shanghai government said that companies in the city are not allowed to resume operations before the 9th of January. That's the day, I think that the day that U.S. citizens started to evacuate from Wuhan, the, the U.S. government actually, I think, chartered planes to get U.S. citizens out of Wuhan at this point. The next day, January 29th, Tibet finally fell. So Tibet, Tibet declared a level one health emergency. So now all of mainland China is under the emergency. And companies in Hebei are required to not resume services before February 13th, and schools are postponed indefinitely. So then we get to the end of the month, January 30th. At this point, all interprovincial charter cars, so this is anything between provinces, charter cars, passenger routes, all been suspended in mainland China. Um, passenger, uh, This is passenger routes to uh, Hubei have been suspended. Passenger transport on roads in 10 provinces and municipalities, including Hubei and Beijing have been suspended, and interprovincial passenger trains were suspended in 16 provinces, urban bus routes suspended in multiple cities in 28 provinces, and urban rail transportation suspended in five cities. So just a lot of craziness, and that's the point at which the World Health Organization declared a global emergency. So That I, you feels know, like a long time ago. <laughs> I know, but I just wanted to walk through it because that was just all in January. So yeah. here we are. We're and filming this so on... So many news every day. Yeah, right. It's crazy. Yeah. So I'm going to fast forward because, you know, that was a lot. I just want to walk through January because that's kind of... We get to the point where it's recognized as a global emergency. So it took almost two months to get to that point from the first uh, case. And so now we can fast forward. Today we're filming. It's the 20th of February. And, you know, by this point, there have been cases confirmed in the UK, Russia, Spain, Sweden, the US has instituted a travel ban, which we'll talk about, uh, Australia, Canada, Germany, Japan, Singapore, UAE, Vietnam. There's been, by the 9th of February, this virus had killed more people than SARS. Russia has banned entry of Chinese citizens. So let's just go over some quick stats as of the 20th of February. By now, there are almost 75,000 cases of this COVID-19 virus, more than 800 of them are outside of China. There have been over 2,000 deaths, 2,118 by last I checked. Uh, 29 U.S. infections was the last number I saw. That might be a couple days old. And let's talk about, can we talk about the virus itself and some things that maybe make it particularly concerning? One of the things is the incubation period, which I think is 14 days. Is that right? Yeah, um, 14 days. Um, some rare cases is 24, but it's like a super rare. Uh, I have some, I have read some article, like some uh, expert, I kind of debunked that. Maybe just like not uh, super relevant to reference that. Yeah, so normally 14 okay. days. So 14 days. And according to the CDC, during this incubation period, it can be asymptomatic, which means you don't know you have it. There aren't any symptoms. Not only are there not symptoms, you may test negative during the incubation period, which is pretty scary. So obviously very hard to detect. Yeah, because for the PCR boxes to test the uh, the RNA, this is the RNA virus, right? Uh, it is uh, kind of hard to make it correct in the first place. And then this kind of virus is not like a, a common cold or like regular flu. It kind of bind with your... Um, kind of upper respiratory uh, system very well. This is bind with the lower part, which is the lung. So when it reached the lung, it's already pretty severe. You already could feel that like you're out of breath, you can't breathe. Um, it's not like you have runny nose or like kind of thought throat, those kind of symptoms. So it, and it can't, we can talk about it for a minute. Maybe we should talk for a minute about how deadly it may or may not be. The Because it... it Sounds bad, but the mortality rate, the official mortality rate isn't that bad. The China National Health Commission is saying it's 2.1%, right? Yeah, but uh, I have seen data, like people actually mocking the government data because every day 
the confirmed cases versus um, like the mortality rate is always 2.1 percent. So okay. they're like, oh, this is the smartest virus ever. It's kind of <laughs> keep the number even every day. Um, but also, I have looked at several kind of uh, hospital data. Um, so people who are confirmed and then the rate getting to ICU is 25%, so which is like alarming rate. It's not like a common cold or like flu. Um, it's not, um, the, it's much, much more severe. So, so you're saying that a quarter of the people who have it actually required intensive care. Yeah. It's that bad. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that, that seems pretty bad. Um, and the, you know, I was reading about what's called CFR case fertility rate or fertility <laughs> fatality rates. I was reading about case fertility rates and the, the way you calculate that after a, an epidemic is very straightforward. You just divide the total number of deaths by the total number of infected people. And that gives you your, your CFR. And that's, that makes sense. The problem is during an ongoing crisis, it's actually very difficult to figure out what the, for, the what the CFR is because the people who are dying today were infected at some time in the past. So one of the ways that you can try and estimate it is you take the number of days, or sorry, the number of deaths today, and you divide it by the number of infected people, however many days ago is the average incubation period, like, or the average period between getting the d disease and death, so, or being, being diagnosed and death. So you have to figure out what that average is, and then you kind of estimate what the fatality rate is using that. And when I looked at the Chinese data, the 2.1%, as you're saying, the smart virus, I guess, is a member of the Communist Party. It knows it's no, it knows what uh, what the right CFR is to, to maintain. But the way that the, the China National Health Commission is calculating the rate seems to just be the number of deaths that day divided by the number of infected people that day, which is not correct, because the number of infected people does not represent the, the deaths that same day. There's a lag between those two. Yeah, there has been some like a surges because or like declining uh, for the past couple of days. Uh, it kind of declined to um, three digit number uh, in uh, Hubei province, which is seems like a good news. Um, it just they keep changing how they calculate it. Uh, the people are just like kind of I think for for the past few days, people kind of just got numb like psychologically because the it just numbered right now. Right. Yeah. And even though the World Health Organization, I think, originally guessed at 2%, but now they're saying they have no idea what it is. I did I did find this just as a, as a comparison point for people interested. During the 2003 SARS epidemic, the WHO reported a fatality rate of 4% or sometimes 3%, so that was their range. Um, but it ended up being 9.6%. So, you know, they were off by a factor of two or three there, depending on how you look at it. And so it's not really clear. We could be looking at a similar. There's one thing I'm not trying to scare people because, um, you know, China has built like at this point, like two hospitals in Wuhan. Mm -hmm. um, so I think one of them, uh, I think each of them hold at least a thousand patients. But still, there's so many stories I have read and soon they got deleted, of course. Um, there are so many people, they just can't get a bed in the hospital. They cannot get treated. So basically within their house, in their, in their apartment, they just one contagious to another person in the family. And then a lot of family I, I saw on the media and they just, the whole family just died. So those people probably not counted. Um, oh, because they, they weren't diagnosed is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, because in the early phase, their lack of the PCR boxes, the, they can't diagnose the, uh, the, the patient anyway. So uh, so I'm like really in the, um, doubtful where's the number. I see. Just to for clarify for the audience, uh, PCR is a polymerase chain reaction. It's used to replicate DNA really quickly so that you can then um, detect things. So that's that's kind of one of the key components of detecting this virus. Let's talk about the rate of transmission then because... You know, you're saying the person in the home gets it and other people, you know, maybe the whole family dies, which I know has happened. The really quickly, the rate the the rate of transmission, what what people will hear being bandied about is this term R naught. 
uh, R naught is basically a measure of how many people on average you would communicate the virus to if you had the virus. So if you're if you have the virus, what's the like, like how many people are you going to infect basically? And obviously, if that number is greater than one, you've got a risk because that means that the number of people infecting is constantly growing. So the WHO estimated this to be 1.4 and 2.5, and that's you know, I guess. Not it's not good, but it's not horrible. The problem is people are not really trusting the WHO. The the latest estimate I saw by a group of Swedish researchers who had looked at this estimated an average of 3.28 as the R naught value, and they said it could be as high as 6.49. So that's much more concerning. And I just want to quote one of these these researchers who was looking at this. This person says. Uh, Joachim Raklov, I'm not sure the gender, so I'm just going to say he, I'm not sure. He says, our review shows that the coronavirus is at least as transmissible as the SARS virus, and that a great deal about the seriousness, and that says a great deal about the seriousness of the situation. When looking at the development of the corona epidemic, reality seems to correspond well to or even exceed the highest epidemic growth in our calculations. Despite all intervention and control activities, the coronavirus has already spread to a significantly higher extent than SARS did. So that's kind of concerning. SARS was a problem, and as we know, uh, COVID-19 has already killed more people than SARS uh, several weeks ago. I remember uh, the fatality rate is about 10%. Yeah, I think it was nine point six for SARS. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, but uh, we have to remember we didn't kill SARS. SARS just disappeared in like summer and May, June ish time frame. So talk about that for a minute, because there's a theory about why SARS disappeared, and that was that it it can't stand the warm weather. Is that right? Yeah, that's what people um, suspecting. But uh, remember, like. There are a lot of um, people infected in uh, Singapore, so uh, we will have to see. Like probably they will um, be better as soon as the temperature gets uh, higher. Um, so we will know, but um, no one can actually confirm that what actually kills it. For for the temperature, I think it's um, about fifty six or sixty five. I forgot Celsius degree. It can uh, the, the virus can be killed. Now, but tell me, I, I don't know this. We're, we're, did SARS, was SARS big in Singapore at the time? Uh, that I don't know. I'll have to do more research on that. Okay. Yeah. Let's pause for a second and do that. Hold on, I'm going to look it up. So according to a quick internet search, SARS did get to Singapore in 2003, and it infected, I think, 238 people, 33 of whom died. So that's kind of weird right because Singapore is always pretty oppressively hot right uh you can do a res- do a quick search about what's the temperature in Singapore right now yeah so I just looked it up the the average temperature in Sing- Singapore goes from maybe 29 a little over 29 in January up to a little over 30 so later on and so in in fact by february it's already over 30 it's kind of constant from february all the way until june so it doesn't really make a lot of sense that it was a temperature change that suddenly killed sars in singapore that doesn't that doesn't make a lot of sense to me yeah we don't know yeah i mean we can only hope maybe it's uh it's different in china Right. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the things the governments have done. We we talked. I, I want to talk about China. I also want to talk about the, what the U.S. government has done, just just so people can be aware. Again, what I'm trying to look at is not what people are saying, but what they're doing. And one of the concerning things that the government is doing is, well, there are a couple concerning things. One is the U.S. government has instituted a travel ban. So foreigners who have traveled to China in the past two weeks will be barred from entering the country. That's a pretty big deal. Any U.S. citizen returning to the U.S. who's been to Hubei province in China will be under mandatory quarantine. So even U.S. citizens are under mandatory quarantine. The CDC, so all, all these people that were flown back from China, they were, they were put in mandatory quarantine, uh, I think on some bases. And the CDC has admitted when they were pressed with there were some problems running, running the quarantine, the CDC said, well, Keep in mind, this is the first time in over 50 years 
that the CDC has issued a quarantine order. That's a that's a long time. That means that this is kind of a big deal to the CDC. They've also replaced uh, placed travel restrictions on Americans on a cruise ship called the Diamond Princess, which is docked off the coast of Japan. That ship's not allowed to return to the U.S. until quarantine is over. I think there's 400 people on the ship that have confirmed cases. So the U.S. is reacting to this in a pretty dramatic way. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier Russia has banned entry of Chinese citizens. So the world is kind of reacting in a pretty severe way. Can you tell me a little bit about what the Chinese government is is doing? We talked about some of the timeline, but what's their reaction been generally, and how are people responding to it in China? So um, in terms of how people are doing right now, so everyone is basically uh, depends on the region. They cannot go outside or they don't want to go outside. For a lot of the communities, um, actually have very strict um, policies that you cannot go to work, of course, and it's delayed. And then only they give out like two tickets a week for you to go shopping for groceries. And even some stricter area, they um, they actually have the community, I don't know, based on city or like what community you're in, they bring groceries downstairs and then they're calling people on the building and, and live in the building. You can come down now and to get your grocery. Um, so basically, um, it's kind of like managed to like a great by great level um, that people just don't have to go outside or they cannot go outside. I mean, we've seen video of armed guards walking around in, you know, biohazard suits. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I mean, those probably are the medical professionals. I'm I'm not sure how police are dressed. Um, Well, they have like, they have what looks like automatic weapons on them. It doesn't sound like a doctor. That's probably in Hubei province because a lot of cities, at least two cities I have seen, if it's not more, are under martial law. Okay. Yeah, so that makes sense for there's uh, soldiers have weapons on the street. So we've also seen trucks driving down the street spraying stuff all over buildings. Yeah, and I also have seen uh, DJI, which is a drone <laughs> company. They are trying to use their drone to sanitize some of the building in Shenzhen as well. So you were talking earlier about how there's not enough services and some of the issues that are happening in China with respect to just getting treated generally. Can you expand on that a little bit and tell us what some of the problems are and some of the stories that you've heard? Right. Um, so the hospital apparently is not enough. If this, this outbreak happening in any country, I think it's not going to be uh, pretty because just so many people got, got, uh, got infected. Um, from what I've been hearing is it's just really hard for people to actually get into those hospitals and then they just have to go back home. Um, I know that some internet uh, company they're trying to like uh, separating um, they're, they're trying to kind of just do online like what we do here like one medical or like kind of some like a Kaiser online uh, doctor appointment so some people are doing that but most of people if they're really con- concerned and they if they go to the hospital they still can't get a bed um, also I have heard about some people have chronic disease uh, which like they need like for example, like dialysis, right? So those resources are even not available at this point. So I have seen like really heartbreaking story, like some parent did just want their kids, I'm like, please take my kid to the other province and then she needs dialysis, right? It's just like horrible. Everything is just out of control. Right, right. And it, and it sounds like, you know, you and I were talking earlier, masks are basically unavailable. Yeah, yeah, masks are not available because uh, pretty much everyone wears one a day if you go out. Um, even the hospitals, they cannot get enough supplies. Um, so there are a lot of scandal came out because the Red Cross in Hubei province, there's just so much um, uh, corruptions. <laughs> even the Hubei province, uh, I think it's the uh, governor 
is the head of the、uh, the Red Cross, Wuhan or something, and they all got replaced or demoted.、Um, so at some point, that all those hospitals, they're like, oh, this donation are designated for us. But when they got there, and then there's no mask or all those like kind of、um, the suit for them. So people the People、uh, online, they're trying to just help to dig it out. It turns out a lot of those things are just given to their other hospital, which is have some relationship with the organization. So it just kind of angers people, and people just distrust this the local government more. So the bu- bureaucracy is basically the corrupt bureaucracy is basically diverting resources to their buddies rather than to the people whom the resources are actually being. Yeah,、donated. maybe they're reselling them. Who knows? That's why people are start getting super angry, and then people who trying to donate stuff there, and then all the money just like disappear. There's so many like ridiculous story.、Uh, I think some. Uh, grocery chain even donated a lot of fresh vegetable, but no one have seen them. Hmm. And you were telling me about some nurses who were unable to get pads for periods. Yeah, this has happened like a couple days ago. Yeah, when I read, I was like really, really angry.、Um, so they are they're very unlimited, a、uh, very limited amount of the the suit, for,、uh, protective suit,、uh, for the doctor and nurses. So. One thing they don't want to kind of waste one for going to bathroom, so they kind of just like、um, maybe have one pad for for a day. Sometimes they don't have the the limited that、uh, they don't have a lot of、uh, pad like kind of in the hospital. So I have seen like people trying to donate into the hospital, and then the I don't know who whoever control the hospital is. Oh, that's not a priority, and that just really angers all the people online. A、so、lot. they're turning down donations, even. Right. I, I, it just like if anywhere needs feminism, I think China needs it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a big fan of feminism generally, but China is on the list of countries that could do well to have a healthy dose of feminism. Maybe we can ship some feminists over to you guys and. Can... <laughs> yeah, it just really, really angers me. And then some,、um, some. You know that some other province they don't have that much of an outbreak. They are sending their、uh, medical team into Wuhan to help,、um, and some of the province they are sending team and、uh, the, like nurses. They are like kind of shave their head. It's not like they really needed to, right? You can, they can cut it short, whatever. They, however, it's manageable, right? But that one particular province, they are actually documenting the whole process. They're like kind of. Set those nurses up to a to a to a ground that they cannot say no because oh you're you guys are doing so great but all the video footage or the picture I've been seeing they are all crying they're they're they don't want to do it so they're kind of being forced to shave their heads for volunteering right I mean they 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 are doing this richer life and that's sad enough but they're like kind of forced into like shaving their head but the narrative will be like oh you're doing this for the greater good. Yes, so they cannot. They, I mean, everyone at this point, they're not like thinking for themselves anymore. Of course, there's some sacrifices happening, but this is kind of like this very basic human beings' rights <laughs> for their hair, right? And it, it just like、uh, ridiculous. Yeah, there, there, there seems to be that seems to always be the answer, right? And it's you're sacrificing for the good of the party or the nation or whatever. Yeah. The another thing I want to point out is so ever since the. Um, this、uh, virus breakout, and then all the narrative on the、uh, stay-at-home media would be like,、um, "This is a war," and then the, a lot of the the language they are using are like, "Oh, I have to fight for it," and like, trying to like, it really kind of like make people to think this is not normal. So that's why I have seen like people. Uh, like like a guard or like a lo- like community like、um, people they're like trying to get into people's house like why are you guys playing mahjong and stop gathering together so that's kind of like like invading people's basic right right you cannot get into people's house normally、right. and there's no more no more like kind of like law exists for some like kind of、uh, villages or like small cities. Well, I mean, authoritarian regimes tend to love crises because it's a it's a way for them to grab power and do things 
they can justify behavior that they they can't really get away with normally. And this is a good segue to something else I want to talk about. We touched on briefly. So when I was going through the timeline, I mentioned a guy named Dr. Lee back in December, who was the guy who posted on the WeChat uh, forum warning people that this was a potential problem. And he was then one of these people that was, I guess, not not arrested, but detained and forced to sign a, a confession of, of some kind. And his story doesn't end there. Can you tell us what happened and what the result is? Um, so he he's actually symbolized the person who spoke the truth and then suffered the consequences of the whole like the the government like regime um that is like fa- being false falsely accused mm-hmm. so people actually view this as like you cannot say the truth if you say the truth and you will be punished and then you die for the cause so that i think well, um, let's let's back up for a second he contracted the disease that they yelled at him for telling people about and then he died he he's actually just an eye doctor to be to be uh, exact okay right so he's not like the, the doctor like front line like treating like exp- respiratory uh disease right so he was only just sharing things that he observed to his like alumni wechat group which is like very like normal right if you find out this is like uh, you warn people this is this is alarming right this is totally reasonable right but he got punished for speaking the truth by the government and then he was and then he, he and then he died and then he died and the government was kind of cagey about how and when he died is that correct yeah that was another really angry thing is um I think he died, I think it's roughly at night or 10 at night. And then there are some media outlet already saying, like confirm that he's died, he's dead. But, and there's, there's suddenly maybe like five, 10 minutes later, and then there are other media will be saying, oh, wait, we're still like trying to, uh, uh, what's the word? Like resuscitate him. Yeah, resuscitate them, uh, him. So I think after a few hours, I think it's like one a.m. or something, and they pronounce is he's like actually dead. So I think he they just don't want people to get actually angry, but people all understand what they're trying to do. So so that I want to dig into that a little bit because people have been very angry about the death of Dr. Lee and the government's treatment of Dr. Lee in a way that you don't see in China very often. You don't see a lot of outspoken people in mainland China criticizing the government. Can you talk about something, some some of the reactions that you've seen? Yeah, um, that that day is just like how people are angry about this just unheard of. It's basically no one else is posting anything different than like kind of paying tribute to uh, Dr. Lee's death. They're all p- posting like pictures of him or like uh, sharing the song. Uh, do you hear the people sing in the, the movie uh, Less Miserable? Right? Right. Um, yeah, so people are just, just, just angry about this intransparency of the whole process because People feel like normally when there's nothing happening, they're happy and they're working hard, they're making money, they're feeding their families. But when things happen like that, this is kind of life and death. You're still punishing people for speaking of the truth and this is the result. And then people are also blaming the local government that are not taking measures earlier and then turning to this like massive outbreak in the city. Right, in a way that maybe it didn't have to if they had listened to right. Dr. Lee earlier. Yes, that's why people are super angry. And then I think the next day for 9 a.m.-ish, and then pretty much everyone like kind of just uh, sending like kind of candle emojis on WeChat platform just kind of uh, pay their condolences to the Dr. Lee. Now, you were saying, though, that a lot of the... the articles that are being written about this or or stories are being pulled down by the government really quickly after they 
are posted. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of became a norm right now. Like a lot of article, if you're not praising how great the government's doing or not praising the positive um, view of the whole situation, you get deleted. Um, especially, you can't question how the government handling everything, or how uh, it's the central government uh, taking care of the whole situation. I, I heard an interview with, I think it was the Chinese ambassador to, maybe it was the UK, I don't remember, but he was trying to spin this narrative that, oh, well, Dr. Lee was a member of the Communist Party, and he is the government. So if you like Dr. Lee, you must like the government because he's one of us. He was trying to kind of uh, <laughs> take ownership of Dr. Lee, even though Dr. Lee was really a victim here. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know what to say. Um, a lot of people are, but still there are people making choices to tell people and warn people about the truth and people there are people who are actively every day deleting posts that are actually the truth so <laughs> you know something something else that struck me and i want to ask you about this is i heard a podcast the other day in which there was a woman whose whose family had some family members had died i think others were infected and she was she was angry about the way that one of her dead relatives was treated and the way that the family was being treated by the government. And she was doing something that I never really hear coming from mainland China. She was openly bad-mouthing the government. She was openly criticizing the Chinese government. And it, it strikes me that if you're one of these people, like the story you mentioned earlier of this person who they lost all of their family, and maybe even they've infected themselves sometimes. At that point, what do you have to lose? It seems like maybe the Chinese people are, they tolerate authoritarianism for so long, but when it's when it really comes down to life and death and they have nothing left to lose, they're no longer tolerant of the authoritarian hand of the government. I mean, for the past few decades, right? Like for when China opened up to for free trade or for like kind of the Western like direct investment and everything, China has made hum like huge progress in terms of like putting people out of poverty. Um, for big cities like Shenzhen, Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, and those cities, their housing is basically the same price, if not more, in the major city in the whole world. So people are, to some level, very content of their lives. And then I, I think a lot of people, they just haven't thought about a lot of these things. I mean, for my parents' age, when they there was Tiananmen, like, square incidents happened, and some of those people still remember, but for the past few years, people are actually happy. They go travel, they buy luxury goods, and they are, their life is not bad. But when things happen like this, the government is totally not prepared. So this whole like kind of authoritarian um, way of ru ruling the whole China is only work when there's nothing like this happens. But for like kind of on the horizontal level for the like kind of maybe individual village, individual province, they don't have a lot of like kind of initiative or opinion how to how to solve problems and how to have things happen quickly. How can they like kind of conquer like issues like this? So you're saying the cultural revolution is a distant memory for a lot of people. For, and for some people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and once you're content, you can kind of tolerate a little bit of bossiness from your government until things don't go well, in which case you get pretty angry. Yeah, especially I think for the past few days is the I think anniversary. I don't know what what year for uh, Deng Xiaoping's like passed away. Mm -hmm. um, so people are all sharing like his thoughts and his like kind of speeches and stuff because he's the one. He's the person actually kind of convince the whole government official by then the central government how we should open up and then how we should kind of just uh, learn by doing and then we shouldn't care about ideology we should just like 
start making money <laughs> if it's put it simple um yeah so people are, are are missing the time like 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 that do you think she has been uh moving the country more towards that or or has he been pulling it back towards authoritarianism i think she has is like his dream is like wanted to make china great again <laughs> he's the trump of china <laughs> well i mean um because there are different different power group in china as well right and then no one knows that he actually gonna kind of change himself into a permanent president um i think he has a lot of ambition uh i think f- i i don't work for uh um government owned entity where i don't deal with a lot of business with them uh, i think uh from what i heard um it's more strict right now um all the narratives and all people like kind of um you can't it, it's just not as free for the past maybe a couple decades yeah in terms of like uh, free speech like media control so you think you're saying that china opened up started to become more free but she has actually kind of closed back up at least the individual freedoms aspect at least from from uh like a media control like free speech control that i've seen and then uh i heard that people are complaining it's more like uh cultural revolution time that a lot of people we can just reporting on other people if they're not saying the right thing I haven't feel that like personally, but I've definitely heard people saying that. Right, right. But but you feel it enough that you want to be anonymous on this show. Well, uh, I still have to go back and do business. <laughs> right. No, I, under- I understand. Um, one thing I want to do is talk about a couple conspiracy theories that have been circulating. And I'm going to say conspiracy theory because I don't know if they're true or not. Well, I'm pretty sure one of them is not true. The other one, it's not, you know, maybe we'll find out in a few years that it turns out to be true. But I just want to throw them out there because they're being discussed and I want people to just be aware of, of, of them. One is kind of a silly one that I'm going to show you now. Here's the, here's the logo for the Umbrella Corporation, which is a fictitious corporation from the video game and movie series called Resident Evil in which they develop nasty viruses that of course turn people into zombies because that makes games more fun. Here is the, here's a biotech company. Here's a picture of a biotech company in China. This has been circulating and people have been saying, for those of you who are listening only, there's basically very, very similar logo to Umbrella Corporation. People have been saying, look, here's this biotech company in Wuhan and this virus was manufactured probably by this. This is, you know, look, they're they're not even, they're hiding in plain sight. It's just like the Umbrella Corporation. All you have to do really is look at this image to see that this is in Shanghai, not <laughs> Hubei, so, or not Wuhan. So uh, I think we can kind of debunk that. It is kind of funny that there's a biotech company with the same logo as the Umbrella Corporation, but that's just a fun coincidence. What is true is that there is, there is a Wuhan Institute of Virology and there were theories about maybe they were trying to develop some sort of viral weapon and it escaped and that the, this whole idea of being the, the, the origin being a fish market is a cover story. The official, all of the expert opinion that I've seen about it is that that's nonsense, that they don't actually do that kind of research, that they couldn't have done that kind of research, they weren't equipped to do it, and it's just silly. But that theory is going out there. Some people are tying it to Bill Gates somehow because of funding for stuff. The other thing I've seen is an article, a journal piece by some Indian researchers that sequenced, I guess they sequenced the DNA of the virus, and they claim that the virus could not have been naturally occurring and that it must be man-made and it looks like a combination of SARS and HIV. Did you see this article? Yeah, uh, the last one I have heard uh, and is has been all debunked. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's man-made. Um, 
I mean, how SARS uh, started is because people are eating uh, this particular, uh, I forgot, it's like a rodent kind of animal mm -hmm. that got a virus from a bat. I think this time people still uh, don't understand what, but it's probably the same sources from um, this particular bat uh, that's basically the same source as the, uh, SARS. Okay. But they don't know what's the in-between animal yet. Okay. Because, yeah, I've also, the, the reactions I've seen to that, the official reactions to that are, no, this is not true. It was just this virus could easily have developed in the wild, and that's what happened. And so, you know, I could be wrong. As a cynic, I'm always going to leave room for there to be some government screwing up somewhere and lying <laughs> about it. But uh, it there's not really concrete proof or even really good evidence that that's the case here. The bat thing is interesting because you were telling me this before the show. The, the bats are quite interesting because they actually is. You were saying they maintain a higher body temperature or something. Yeah. And kinda what does like that allow them to do? Kind of like what we are in fever. I'm not like a biologist or any virologist per se, but I've been reading some of the stuff. Uh, so bats are really interesting creature. So they. They're, they're ancient, right? Like, they actually have tons of virus, like, live within them, but they don't actually get infected. And Which they is, don't get infected because they're in some sort of constant state of yeah. Fever, they're, it's their their DNA is different, and then uh, when they're like flying, they're they their just body temperature is all really high, just like when we are like in fever. So kind of just keep the virus out, and then like not getting influenced by it. So they make really good incubators, and they're mammals. So they make really good incubators for viruses that can cross over into other mammalian species, but they themselves can kind of carry it around without being killed. Yeah, there's a one really good uh, TED uh, video that I watched. Uh, it's a researcher. He's like battling with uh, rabies in South America. I think particularly in like a village near Lima. So basically, there's a lot of bats that kind of biting on the villagers, and then they're spreading rabies. Uh, so basically, all those like deadly virus, they're all from bad, from what I've been seeing. Do people eat bats in China? Is that a thing? That's not a thing. <laughs> okay. Just curious. I mean, there are some people, they're just doing gross things, and that's just not everyone. Uh <laughs> I know people have very people think Chinese people eat anything. Fair enough. All right. Well, we can we can move on from bats. I just wanted to address those things. What what are some of the the things that the West needs to know about what's happening, and maybe some of the ways that it might impact people in the West? Mm, I think it's generally pretty safe because the all the travel are banned. Uh, I think um, from from the impact perspective, it's more in the economic perspective. Uh, for example, pretty much all the manufacturing uh, are delayed. Uh, I think probably 30% of what you can buy in the U.S. are made in China, um, especially like consumer electronics. 99% uh, of our iPhones are made in China. And then I heard that Switch, Nintendo Switch, will be out of stock soon. Um, so no game. <laughs> we, we can't play games. Yeah. Uh, but good news is I think this week is uh, a lot of factory are star um, kind of applying to open up the factory again. So it's a long process. Even for my companies, it's like you have to file uh, that you can... Uh, where your employees coming from, where have they been traveled, uh, what's their temperature uh, logs are like, and then there's a lot of things. What's the measure or procedure if you're gonna uh, if you're gonna take if there's like people coming back to work, if there's an outbreak or anything. Uh, so there's a lot of thing to to do. For, so for I just want to be clear. It sounds like you're not allowed to open your doors as a business unless you apply to the Chinese government right now to, to do that. And, you, and follow this big, long process involving temperature logs of all of your employees for the past several yeah, days. Yeah, and then it's, it's like kind of province 
based. They they had to all have different regulations or policies, and some places are even like kind of changed daily. So it's like a really really hard to, <laughs> yeah. Um, for 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 law business, it's, it's really really hard because after the Chinese New Year, for example, like retail or like tourism,、uh, restaurant, they're the best month, but they're <laughs> they're they're devastated. Um, but on the on the other hand, China has been pouring tons of money, billions and billions, um, R and B to save, trying to save business like like those, um, and also they are kind of delaying business for paying taxes in a lot of ways, and then there's a lot of grant that you can apply for, so that's the measure they're taking. So, have there been a lot of business failures, or are these measures working? Uh, there are some companies already dead. Of course, but、uh, I think a lot of companies are just like kind of、uh, fire part of the comp、uh, the employees or like kind of paying them at a minimum level,、um, or they just start kind of applying more loans. I mean, because a lot of companies don't have operating capital to keep paying without getting revenue for an extended period of time. Right. Yeah. There's several like big restaurant chains that are like complaining、uh, in the first in the beginning of the. The quarantine, and then I think、uh, most of them got got loans, yeah, because they they're saying basically they will be dead after two months. But、um, yeah, they seems they seems、uh, got loans. Right. So, you know, even stuff that's not made completely in China, a lot of times parts are made in China for things, so it could clog up the works for stuff that's manufactured in the U.S. but parts are in China or something. Yeah,、uh, I mean, if for for apparel industry,、um, if a lot of the factories are outside of China right now, maybe the in Vietnam, maybe in like Malaysia, but still, a lot of the fabric or like cotton, the the raw material are in China. So, for example, Hubei Province, they is like a big province to produce cotton, and then a lot of those、uh, Hubei people there. They owns were specializing like in in apparels, right? Yeah. So me personally, I have a quarter of my employees are still stuck in there, and I don't think they will be able to get out. Yesterday, the news is、uh, March eleventh. They'll be able to kind of end the quarantine, but who knows? Right. Right. Well, I guess my one last my one last question is is really, do you think that Any of this discontent with how the government is is behaving? Do you think any of this will translate to any real change in China, or do you think it will just go away?、Um, I think doubtful.、Um, but I do, on the other hand, but I do see、um, regular people. They are paying attention. To all these articles, they're like paying attention all to this kind of like individual level of stories and how being empathetic. So that's comforting. I think if、uh, if not all of them, but、uh, still, some people think the authoritarian、uh, measure, like kind of quarantine, like force you to stay at your home,、uh, and then taking this extreme measure is is great. And some people think that if it's outside of China, if other countries know, government can handle this as well.、Um, personally, I don't really agree.、Um, but I think the young, young generation, they will understand it because、um, they they probably more empathetic and they they knows some 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 measure they are not correct. They're just not right. You cannot come into people's house like whatsoever. Right. Well, Ying Lua, I really appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us. I hope、uh, your family、uh, survives and 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 does well in China and doesn't have to deal with any major problems. And I hope you're able to return soon. Thank you. 